In this video, I will give you ideas on how you can present the buyer representation agreement and soften the blow of this rather intimidating looking document. Also, how to address some objections that you may encounter when you present this, because this representation agreement is five pages, which is already lengthy, but it's part of a 13 page bundle, which makes it very lengthy. And naturally, when you drop this in the lap of a new client, it's going to be intimidating. It's going to scare them because it's a 13 page contract full of legalese and they don't know exactly what they're signing up for. They're nervous. They don't want to do this. Historically, they never had to do this. They never had to sign one of these. They had the luxury of agents, maybe multiple agents working on their behalf without any sort of document signed. And all these agents were running around doing research or, or doing showings and there was no cost or commitment or anything. Well, all that's changed. So given that this naturally is going to scare a buyer, it's going to be up to you to soften that blow by educating and informing the buyer. So this looks a lot less scary and is more approachable. Now in your arsenal, you should also have on standby a seller payment to buyer's broker form, the, the one page SPBB form. And you're going to have a modification of terms form specifically the buyer representation version. There are two versions of this one's for modifying a listing agreement. This is the MTBR to modify the buyer representation agreement. And you're just going to keep these in your back pocket because the, these are going to help you present this representation agreement so you can alleviate concerns and make this document more approachable. Now I should say that the first challenge that you're going to have is just a flat out rejection of this document because you're going to present this to a buyer client and they're not going to want to sign it. I mean, it'll be a chore just for them to read it. Why should they? They never had to before. They didn't have to last time they purchased a property. Why now? It's up to you whether you want to explain the backstory with lawsuits against NAR or the class action lawsuits that sellers in, in different places had have lodged against NAR and some other companies that allege that sellers were getting an unfair bargain with their representation. And however you want to phrase it, all of that, all of the, the legal backstory has culminated into a new requirement, a national requirement for all realtors in the country to have a buyer representation agreement in place. It's so serious that I don't know about other MLSs, but in Southern California, if, if you enter a property, if you show a property without a representation agreement in place as a realtor, you get a $2,500 fine. It's very serious. And that fine is in addition to whatever other reprimanding you can receive by showing it, by showing a property without a representation agreement. Now, do you need to give this whole backstory and all this realtor association drama to your client? I mean, no. I mean, you could give a one or two liner and just say, you may have heard about lawsuits. Well, it's culminated into a requirement that all realtors throughout the country must have this document signed by a, a client before entering a property for legal transparency. Now, that alone may not suffice in alleviating concerns for the buyer. That's why if a buyer were to say that to me, I would inform them they absolutely do not have to have representation and I'm not going to convince them otherwise. If you want to be represented by a real estate licensee, that's a realtor, a professional realtor, they must have this document signed. If not with me, then they're going to have this exact same document with another agent down the street. If you don't want an agent, fine. You can self represent. You don't need a representative at all. You can go into it. People do this in law. People can represent themselves. You can go to court without an attorney. Is it a good idea? No, but some people do it. And you can make that comparison. You can also tell them you can hire an attorney, contact a real estate attorney, call them today. The thing is, is that in addition to realtors requiring this, in some states, this is already a requirement. In California, there's talk about this becoming a, a law as well. And so it won't even matter if this is a requirement for realtors, it'll be a state law requirement for anyone representing a buyer. 
But I would inform the buyer and say, look, listen, if you want to work with a realtor, a real estate licensee, that's a, that's a professional realtor, then they're all going to require this. It doesn't matter where you go. If you don't want any representation, you want to go to court and represent yourself, go for it. Be my guest by all means. It's not your job to convince a buyer that they need representation. You can tell them how foolish it is, but that's it. I'm not trying to change their worldview. If you can't figure out that you need a representative, I'm not going, I'll, I'll let you know it's a bad idea, but I'm not going to try to change you. And finally, just tell them, okay, go to a real estate attorney. Call three of them. See how much they charge. I mean, a real estate attorney, these comments I see where I see angry buyers in, in, in comments on my videos, you know, that don't like real estate agents and they say, I'll just hire an attorney. Okay, go for it. I mean, for years I've worked with so many attorneys and let me tell you, every time they pick up the phone, the clock's going and you get billed. The, co the, the, the notion that it's cheaper, more economical to have a, 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 a real estate attorney represent you throughout a transaction is absolute and utter nonsense. Those comments always prompt an eye roll. So that's where you're going to tell a buyer that is refusing to sign this. Now, <clears throat> a buyer might also say that, and, and you know, here, let me give you another premise to approach this with. When you get an objection from a buyer, it's your job to accelerate their thinking because ultimately this is going to come down to them realizing that there aren't alternatives. You're going to, you're, and, and so when a buyer first sees this, they might say, oh, I'm not signing this or the other agent isn't asking for this. When I say educate and inform, you're educating and informing the buyer because this is so much to digest. But once they do digest it, it's, they're going to realize that it's this way or no way. And so you're going to accelerate them through the thinking process of, 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 their, of their mind wondering about all these different variables, all these different other alternatives they have to signing this. And when they realize how limited their, their options are, then it's going to get you through the objections faster. So you can tell them, I mean, you, you, can, you can think out on going unrepresented and, and representing themselves through a transaction. Think it out with them. They'll say things like, well, I could just go to the listing agent and have them write the offer. Well, no, the listing agent represents the seller, right? If the listing agent represents you, they are going to have you sign this same document. Now you've brought them back to square one. They're signing this no matter what. Well, a listing agent could write this up for me and not represent me. Okay, you're unrepresented and you're having the opposite sides fiduciary write your contracts. If you were sued and you went to court, would you have the opposing party's attorney file your, your response to a complaint? Would you have your spouse's divorce attorney write up your agreement to a settlement? Give these analogies and explain that if they go to the listing agent, they're going to have to either A, have this signed or B, have no representation. They're going to have no representation unless the listing agent's name is written as a buyer's agent and they have this exact same form signed. They're just having the, the fiduciary of the other person that they're negotiating against do paperwork illegitimately, mind you. The listing agent has no business, zero business drafting an offer. So they're going, they're, they're doing it illegitimately unless they're writing their own offer. Now, if they want to go pay an attorney to draft an offer, there you go. Now you're unrepresented by all means have at it, have at it. I'll be here. If you need to hire an agent in the future, again, it's not up to you to change their mind about, about needing representation. All right, so the next objection you're gonna run into, and so, and by the way, you can soften the blow by explaining as you go through here, listen, we're doing a short-term period here. There's a max period of three months, which is not a long time, and you can shorten it to something that they're comfortable with. If you fill this out with the buyer's input, they're going to feel like they had a say in this document and that they were part of its creation rather than you filling something out and this shoving it in front of them and saying, sign this. So I think it would be good for you to have a conversation and ask them, hey, th my representation agreement can't exceed three months. How long would you like the period to be? Let them choose. 
let them choose or talk talk them out with it and then let them know that you're going to input whatever they decide when you fill this form out so they feel like they have a say in its creation. Now, type of representation is another place you can have a buyer objection because they may talk about uh, not wanting to go exclusive. Now, this is where you're gonna have to set a boundary that is your personal decision because for me personally, there's no way I'm signing I'm, uh, that I'm going to do a representation that's not ex that's not exclusive. That's not happening. If you want me to spend my time, my money, my gas, my memberships to multiple associations, MLSs, the tools I buy, whatever it is, my time, which is valuable, to do this, I'm not competing with other people. Now, if someone is objecting to exclusive representation. One way you can negotiate that down is give them a way out, a cancellation, and say, listen, because here's a buyer objection. You tell them, I wanna go exclusive. They go, but what if you don't answer the phone? I like my agent to be available on the weekends or nights or at 7 a.m. or they tell you something, what if you're not available? I don't wanna be stuck with you and then have you disappear on me. That happened with my last agent. You can say, fine, give them an escape clause give them a cancellation. And I'll explain a little more on cancellation because it actually, we, we have to address it later in this document. But I, I would rather whittle down the, the cancellation limitations to nothing, effectively making it easier for a party to cancel than go non-exclusive. If you really want the client and you're comfortable going non-exclusive, go for it. I'm telling you I wouldn't, but I, I set fairly firm boundaries with how I operate. I would say go exclusive, and if they have concerns about it, I would I would say, I would find out what the concern is. Any objection you get, you, you need to ask why. You can't just hear objection and then give a counter argument. You have to ask why. The most objections you're getting is because this document's overwhelming. Why is it overwhelming? It's a bunch of legalese and that's scary. And when people get scared and they feel like they don't know, then they just say no. And so that's the, that's the overall rejection. When they, on a micro level, each provision that they're going to take issue with, it's the same idea. I'm scared because I'm going to be stuck. You're going to trap me. You're going to ask something from me that I don't want to give. So it's a matter of having a conversation and saying, okay, why is that? And then you find out something like, well, my last agent ghosted me. My last agent disappeared. My last agent went on vacation when I needed him or her to write an offer. And so you say, okay, I understand how that works. Here's why I like exclusive. But if you're concerned about that, let's give you a way out. You can cancel if I'm not available and you put in a cancel cancellation clause. That's what I would do. I would whittle it down so they can cancel easier. <clears throat> okay. so. When we get down here, so let me sh go down to the next spot. Here's the big one, amount of compensation. This is going to be huge. So you're going to put in the most ambitious number. That ambitious number is going to be not what someone's going to want to see. 3% compensation, oh my gosh. Again, this is all going to shock them. So you, you have to talk them through the shock, wear it off, let it wear off so they understand and get more comfortable. The reason you're putting a number in here is that you're going to explain. And context is very important. You can add context with explaining why this forms a requirement now and how no, no matter how they, what, no matter the approach they take, the representative they get, every agent's going to ask for this. Same thing with compensation. You have to explain to them that part of it now is that the buyer is going to pledge to pay the, commi the commission but you explain to them how it works. So you tell the buyer, I'm going to write in the commission that I want for the services rendered here. Then you're going to tell them, but here's what's going to happen. And here's why you may not have to pay all this at closing. You're going to explain the seller payment to buyer's broker form, the SPBB form. You need to show this form to your, your buyer during when you're presenting this representation agreement you need to explain to them here's how it works when we write an offer i should have an rpa our rpa up here too on the rpa page two top of page two where it's where you check the box 
but you can check the SPB box. You can show them on an offer. When I write an offer, I'm going to check that box and we're going to incorporate this form and we're going to ask the seller to pay that commission. The commission right here is subject to this. If the broker receives compensation from the seller or others, anyone, if anyone pays me, the listing broker, the seller, whomever, for broker representation, that amount's credited toward this. It's credited toward your, your obligation. So it's relief. We're asking for relief for your payment. I'm asking you to retain my services at 3%, but when I write an offer, I'm gonna write in relief for you. I'm gonna write in that the seller is gonna pay 3%. Now, they may push back on the price. Why did I put 3% here? You wanna put the most you can. Put five, put 10%, put whatever you, you can. I mean, I know a lot of agents are just gonna put two or two and a half percent, but, but you know, let's put the highest that we can. And this is an example. I'm just writing in 3%. You're going to put the 3% there and tell them, I'm going to ask the seller for relief of your obligation equal to what's on here. Now, and if and when the seller agrees to 3%, that's going to alleviate your entire burden here. It cancels it out. That is going to help alleviate. But they're going to say, why are you putting this high number? I'm not comfortable with that. And you need to tell them, the reason I'm putting this number here, or let's say a buyer says, I've never paid more than 2% of my life, blah, 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 blah. You can tell them, and this justifies your number. By the way, I always see these comments about, about antitrust and uh, uh, collusion of pricing. That's just absolute such nonsense. But put the highest number you can. It's, it's just that customarily agents will take between one and 3% customarily that's what someone wants to make for the amount of time and effort that they spend on a transaction put whatever number you want but the reason when the buyer pushes back that you're putting a high number and how you're going to explain it is that there's this clause maximum seller payment obligation the maximum that you the agent can get paid is what's ever here so you can tell the buyer listen i could put in 500 dollars right here here's the problem though when I go and I ask someone else to pick up the tab for you, when I try to negotiate relief for you, I'm limited to whatever is on the representation agreement. That's what this says. It creates a cap, a limit, a ceiling. Whatever I put here, I can't make more than that. So if I put some super low number just to make you more comfortable because you're anxious, that's the most I can make when someone else actually picks up your tab. <clears throat> now, the next objection in that line of thinking is, well, what if the seller won't pay? What if the seller will only pay 2%? You can tell them, when I send this form on your behalf, or when I send this form with our offer, the seller may counter it out. The seller might just counter it down to 2%. And you can let them know, you know, so much of real estate activity is what's customary or what you see typically that happens organically in uh, just through the business, uh, through thousands of transactions. And that's that's how NAR kind of got hosed in this in this uh, all these absurd lawsuits, because they th those lawsuits have this presumption that NAR somehow is controlling and NAR just creates their for their forms in reaction to the marketplace. It's kind of funny. I mean, I see things in the marketplace and then I'll see a year later, NAR has added a provision to their form based on the behavior of agents. And that behavior just comes organically. So it's, it's kind of funny because they're blaming NAR, like NAR has this top down control over what agents are doing. And it's, it's in terms of uh, like financial terms, things like this, it's, it's quite the opposite. NAR is actually behind the ball. They're not leading it. But you can tell them, look, customarily, customarily, or you can tell them right now, typically the seller already expects, this is a conversation between a listing agent and the seller. The seller already expects to offer concessions, to offer relief to the buyer. This is already a conversation taking place. So they're going to expect to see this form. 
This is becoming a new standard. And if that amount is less, <clears throat> here's what I'm going to do. Let's say they counter it back. Let's say, let's, you're telling your buyer, let's say I ask for the same amount that's in our representation agreement. Hopefully they pay it and you're off the hook. That's it. But what if, what if they come back and they say they only paid two and a half percent? The buyers, and you can tell the buyer, if that happens, if they counter less than what I have on the representation agreement, you are responsible for the difference. You would pay the half a percent if they counter two and a half percent. But if you don't want to charge the buyer, because there's nothing restricting an agent from offering a buyer rebate, I mean, you can rebate it later, but the simple fix for this is you can tell your buyer, if that happens, I will then create this form, a modification of terms, and I will just simply update our representation agreement to show compensation decreasing from 3% to 2.5%. And then you want to write this in. I wrote in upon the acquisition of this, this property here because you don't want to change this universally. This form will change. If you put 3% three three to 2.5%, you've universally changed this representation agreement. And if the, the purchase that is, if the negotiation where you got countered down to 2.5%, if that falls apart and you have to keep looking for new property, and you haven't put that property address here, then you've now reduced your, your representation agreement from three to two and a half percent on any future property. So that's why I'm saying this is exclusively for this particular property. But the reason that you're showing this is because when you come to this objection, you can explain to your buyer, because again, at the end of the day, we're, 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 we're playing out all these different scenarios. We're accelerating the buyer's thinking because in the buyer's mind, when they're looking at this, all this overwhelming information, they're thinking, scary, what if this, what if that, what if this? You're, you're accelerating those scenarios. Well, if this happens, then you do this. And if that happens, then here's our response. So that's what's going to help them feel informed about what they're getting into and, and, and more likely to uh, sign the form and you can proceed with representing the buyer. So. Here's, here's a couple other things worth mentioning about commission. You cannot have any ambiguity in terms of commission. You can't, this is written explicitly, explicitly in, the, in the settlement agreement. You can't put something like, you can't check this box and write in some lengthy rhetorical compensation agreement that if this, then that, if this, then that. You, you cannot have any ambigu ambiguity. It must be definitive financial terms. You also cannot make any sort of mention, and you can tell us to the buyer, well, why don't you write that in there? If the buyer says, why don't you just write in something? Why don't we create some verbiage in here that says that if, you know, that the, sellers, the seller is going to pay? Well, I mean, it already says right here that if anyone pays anything, me anything, if anyone pays me, your representative, anything, it gets deducted from there. Well, why can't we write in that it has to be it has to be zeroed out and I won't have to pay anything because that's explicitly prohibited in the settlement. You could Google the settlement, find the, the, the page on the document. I've looked at it countless times and it'll tell you right there that you cannot offer no cost services unless you truly are charging zero, meaning you can never make anything on a transaction. But what I'm saying is, you, you, can tell, you can tell a buyer that wants additional verbiage that guarantees this, that that's explicitly prohibited. That is explicitly prohibited from the, uh, stemming from the, the settlement. You just have to tell them, I'm showing you, I'm showing you in advance, this is what we're going to do. We're gonna to offer to cancel it out here and any difference we can just eliminate with this MT form. <clears throat> By the way, at a certain point, if you, if you have polished your presentation, if you can deliver it, deliver responses to any concerns, inform an educated buyer, and they want to walk, let them go. I mean, you are not begging for business here. You're explaining a new standard that a buyer is going to have to face with any realtor representation. And the alternative is not hiring a realtor, be my guest, go to court without an attorney, or 
hire an attorney, be my guest, have fun writing checks, or have an agent. It's up to them. It's not up to you to convince them. It's not up to you to beg them or offer them free services. At a certain point, you have to say, this is what I charge for my services. Are there less expensive people out there? Yes. Is the quality inferior? Absolutely. That's why I have a base of what I charge. The end. At a certain point, you need to understand that what you offer has value. And if someone's not going to meet that, you walk away. And if that happens again and again and again, and you can't get anyone to pay you for what you do as a real estate professional, then find a new profession. Leave real estate. I'm telling you. I'm this, And I'm saying in a positive and constructive way, if you can't set a limit, a base of what you charge, and and you can't set a limit that people will pay, then you need to leave the industry because it's not worth it. And you're going to leave it eventually if that's the case. I'm just telling you. I'm accelerating that for you. How about that? Let me come down to a another... Let's talk about <clears throat> the cancellation because this is going to tie in with, with getting an exclusive contract signed. So... If you have a non-exclusive agreement, the parties can cancel whenever. If you have an exclusive agreement, which is what I advocate for, it requires a 30-day notice. Why is that? I don't know. If someone knows, leave a comment, please. But it sounds excessive. If you, if you want away from some buyer that you don't want to work with, or the buyer doesn't want to work with you, why do you need 30 days? I mean, a buyer's out looking for homes. They have to wait 30 days before they find someone else. It's almost like this provision's meant to sabotage the exclusive representation. I mean, it really is. I mean, I've gone through these forms with a fine-tooth comb so many times now. I, I could tell you so many things wrong with it. But this, this is just one of them. And this right here makes no sense to me because it's way too much time. <clears throat> it's way too much time. Now, there may be something in here, I don't know, or some statutory reason, but I would change this no matter what because I don't want to be stuck with giving someone a 30-day notice and I, and I don't feel right to trap a buyer for 30 days if it's not a fit. If it's not a fit, we need to go other ways. Now, the reason why I would change it and I would just write it in in other terms to reduce this, if the buyer's pushing back and doesn't want exclusive representation and saying, because I something happened to me before and I was stuck and I don't want to be stuck again. That's reasonable. I totally get that. It's not me against the buyer. It's two people trying to figure out how to make it work. We both have boundaries. How can we come together? And so if a buyer says that, I get it. I mean, I don't want you to be trapped either. I'm not trying to trap you. I'm trying to help you find a property that you love and it'll be a win-win for both of us. It's not about me trying to trap you. It's about me not getting, you know, age, I, agents get exploited all the time by buyers. Somehow all the haters in the comments seem to uh, never take into consideration the fact that buyer's agents invest so much time and money and get, and get, and get hosed. They always talk about, they always think agents are the, the predatory ones. It's another absurd notion, but to get them out of, to get a buyer out of this cancellation, the, this 30 day waiting period, write something in here. Now there's a problem. That, 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 that that's created and that is down all the way down here paragraph 15 there's this clause in here and it basically says that it it talks about the 30-day written notice and then within five days of giving of giving a list to your buyer of properties in which you did work broker services they call it Broker services are like, you've done research, you ran comps, you educated them on a property that you found, you showed them the property, you drove in your car that you paid for, you paid for insurance, you paid for gas, you, and then you spent your valuable time in a professional manner showing them a property. You make a list of all those, of all those properties that you've shown. Now it says here that if within five days, so you have to give a written notice, and here's why, there's this continuation clause and I put 30 days up top. <clears throat> I'll show you real quick. But when you fill this out, you put in a continuation period. And I put in 30, put in 60, put in 90. But the point is, is this right here extends how long you can be paid after the end of this agreement if the buyer enters into 
uh, enters into a contract on a property that you did broker services. You showed the property. And this is to prevent a buyer from canceling or letting the agreement expire and the very next day writing an offer with another agent on a property in which you did all the legwork. So it protects you. You did work and you don't want a buyer to cut you out and write an offer the next day. So that's why it gives this continuation period. Well, for that continuation period to be valid, you need to create a list of every home in which you did those services. And the problem is with this, this problematic exclusive 30 day notice verbiage is it says, Hey, you have to give a 30 day notice in it, both you and the buyer. And in addition to that, if you want a continuation period to cover some properties you did work on, you need to give that notice within five days of the end of this, of that 30 day waiting period. This is a, a mess. This is honestly a mess. This whole thing is such a mess. So, <clears throat> but I'll tell you how to clean it up. I'll give you a solution. <clears throat> so my solution is if you write this in, if you write in, if you shorten the cancellation, which is what I would do if someone threw a fit. And let me tell you, if someone agrees to exclusive, just let it be, let it be. And cause you can always agree to accelerate the, the 30 day, uh, 30 day waiting period. If you want in writing, you can always shorten that so you can fix it after the fact. But if you're negotiating in how to, how to, how to get an exclusive contract, where's exclusive? All the way up here. If you're and they're saying, look, I just don't want to be held in. You can reduce the notice and just say immediate notice or five day notice and age and broker shall have 48 hours from cancellation to deliver buyer a notice of properties for the continuation period. I could, I could probably give you succinct verbiage and have this down in like less than seven words. But the point is, is that you need to just make a mention that you have 48 hours after cancellation to deliver a list of properties in which services were performed. That's where I'm getting at. I hope this kind of went on this abstract tangent, but I'm just telling you, so it doesn't blow up in your face later that you can shorten the cancellation period. So you're not stuck with someone for 30 days. It's crazy. Maybe there's a reason. Tell me if there is one, you can shorten that, but just make sure that you don't shoot yourself in the foot with this whole continuation period provision and that you, you write in that you have 40 days after cancel 48 hours after cancellation goes into effect to, to deliver a list of properties in which services were performed, something to that effect. If you want, if you want exact verbiage, write a comment and I will, I will put exact succinct verbiage in the comment. But that's it. Those are the main objections. This went on a little bit longer than I thought. Hopefully I didn't go on too many tangents. If you have questions, leave a comment and I really appreciate you watching and hopefully you found this helpful. Thank you.